Kia ora everyone. So I'm John Bunnell from GNS Science. Just going to um, do something a little bit different and look at uh, some estimates that I've been working on on what we might be able to expect from some supercritical wells. By supercritical here, I mean something where the temperatures are above that 374 degrees. Um, going to mostly rely on wellbore modelling for this, so just have a quick look at what's happening there. Um, discuss what are the components that are going to contribute to um, contribute to the performance of a well. Look at an example. Um, discuss some typical productivity for wells and then um, look in more detail at a potential well in the Taupo volcanic zone in New Zealand. So just going to start with well war modelling. You've already seen a couple of talks. Benoit um, presented some of the equations that we use when we do this well war modelling. What I'm looking at here is where we're assuming that we have steady flow in a well. Um, we're not explicitly including the reservoir in this, so we're, we're really only looking at the flow within the well bore itself. And we're solving um, momentum and energy conservation equations. And we can see an example of what we can achieve here. So this is a, a well in the, um, Indonesia where some data was available. Um, it's, um, we've got some measurements that were taken while the well was flowing. And with the first plot is the flowing pressure and the second plot are the estimated velocities and the the, um, the orange dots are measured data and the blue line is the model. So you can see that we're getting fairly close to what we observed within this well, particularly given the complexity of the well. You can potentially see that you've got a number of feed zones at the well where you're getting these changes of velocity occurring. So. This type of wellbore modelling, even though it is relatively simplified, and as I say, it doesn't include the reservoir within it, can be particularly useful for trying to understand productivity of a well in a geothermal system. So what are the things that determine the performance of a well? Um, the obvious one are the reservoir properties, so the permeability in particular. Um, but, sorry, the permeability. Um, we're, we're, I guess we're, we're aware of examples where wells have been drilled into low permeability areas where they just refute, they don't flow at all. But there are some other properties of the reservoir that also contribute. And the reservoir pressure and enthalpy are important ones. Um, so again, you might um, initially drill into a reservoir where you have good permeability and you have good pressure. But over time, as you um, continue to develop that resource, you'll find that the the pressure may decline. You may start to deplete um, a steam zone that's feeding the well, those sorts of factors, and you'll find that the, the output from the well will decline. So the other thing, so these, these are um, factors of the reservoir, properties of the reservoir, which influence those um, performance of the well. We also find within the um, high enthalpy geothermal systems that, that um, um, non-condensable gases can influence the performance. So higher levels of non-condensable gases can sometimes give you better performance from these wells. What I'll sometimes be looking at here in terms of um, uh, trying to understand the performance of a well is one of these things called an output curve. So what we're looking at here is for that example from the Indonesian well that I showed before. Um, We've got wellhead pressure along the bottom here, and then we've got flow rate along the um, vertical axis. Typically, um, a geothermal power station will run with wellhead pressures in the sort of the 15 to maybe 8 bar range, um, although it is quite dependent on, on the setup. So we've got this um, approach of being able to estimate output from a well, but can it work? with these supercritical wells. So I decided to have a look at um, IDDP1, which again has been discussed a little bit in previous talks. Um, so I tried to put together a wellbore model based on publicly available data. And you can see here the match of that model to the output curve. So again, this is measured output, cur uh, measured output curve in the orange dots and then the model to it. So it's a really good fit for this. Um, so what was it that I needed to provide for this model? to produce that that um, fit to that model. So what do we need? So we need to understand the construction of the well. So we need the well track, where the well strings are, 
that is what are the diameters of the casing at different um, depths. We need to know what the reservoir conditions were. And for this well, there were estimates of those. Uh, we had 180 bar and 450 degrees. And then we need to know what this productivity or the permeability within the reservoir is. Now, for this IDDP1 well, this was something that I estimated to fit that. So I fitted that to get the model to fit the measured data. So where you have measured data, you're able to um, use some sort of fitting process to get these permeability productivity. Um, I'll be using this term PI. Um, it's, a, it's a productivity index of some sort. It's got units, um, meters cubed. It's related to permeability. Um, it's essentially permeability times a couple of factors that relate to the wellbore itself, uh, uh, essentially a, a length scale that relates to the wellbore itself. So that permeability is something that we can fit if we have data, but if we're starting to look at wells that we're drilling um, into area, so if we're starting to look at output for wells that we've not yet drilled in these very deeper zones, how are we going to get some estimates of that permeability, that productivity? So I had a quick look at some data that I had available on those productivity indices from a number of sources. Um, this is not a, an exhaustive list. It was just some numbers that I could find with a very quick um, search over an afternoon. But for a typical permeable um, New Zealand Taupo volcanic zone well, you'd have these PIs in the range 10 to the minus 12, maybe to 5 by 10 to the minus 11. For Ohaki, which is a specific field, I found some published data, 3 by 10 to the minus 13 to 10 to the minus 11. For some wells in Japan, 10 to the minus 12 to 3 by 10 to the minus 11. The Philippines, 10 to the minus 13 to 10 to the minus 11. And then Los Humeros, um, 4 by 10 to the minus 14 to 2 by 10 to the minus 13. So more permeable areas, more permeable wells are going to have these productivity indices in the order of 1 to 5 by 10 to the minus 11. And the less permeable ones are probably going to be 10 to the minus 13, maybe down to 10 to the minus 14. Um, but that that's typically a lot of these um, these estimates have come from systems that are hosted in volcanic rocks. So maybe these are on the higher ends of um, what we might expect to see as we go deeper, but at least they give us a bit of a starting point. So some of the other factors that we had in, um, that we need to know in order to uh, assess performance are things like the, um, the well design um, and then the likely reservoir conditions that we'll find, the pressures and temperatures. So I thought, so just recently, Brian um, and some of his colleagues have published a report on some prognoses for um, a couple of supercritical wells that could be drilled in New Zealand. And we can see some example temperature profiles um, in the plots here. So I've used these as a basis for some simulations. Um, so I think for these simulations, I've um, I've assumed that the well is 500 meters deep. Um, and from that I can get, sorry, not 500 meters, 6,000 meters deep. And for that, um, I can read off the temperature. If I assume a hydrostatic, um, pro, a hydrostatic pressure gradient within the reservoir, I can get the pressure from that. And so then the thing that I'm, I'm missing are those productivity indices. Um, now, this is all highly speculative. You know, these temperatures are, you can see are quite simplified. Um, and when I when I use some different um, productivity indices, there are going to be um, a lot of assumptions in this. But I've taken I've taken a design for this well. Um, I've then used a range of those PIs going from one by ten to the minus twelve down to one by ten to the minus thirteen, and we've plotted the three different output curves that we get here. And so potentially we're going to get something like, um, we might be able to get flow rates up in the 70, 70 kilograms per second if we have this relatively high productivity index. And then it's nearly a factor of 10 lower if we're down at um, 1e to the minus 13 for that productivity index. So for this um, type of flow rate here, we're probably looking at something like a 30 or 40 megawatt well. 
um, which is good, but they already exist within um, a number of the New Zealand um, high, temp high enthalpy production systems. We do have a few wells that are producing approximately 30 megawatts. So they're good, but not necessarily outstanding for here. And you can see we've got a, a, a large range in potential outputs depending on what the properties of the reservoir are down there. I had a quick look at what might happen if you um, if you change the size of your borehole that you were drilling. So we got running here from eight and five eighths inches up to 13 and three eighths. There's not really a lot of difference. You don't get really get a lot of increase in output in doing that. Um, I thought I'd try to see what happened if we um, drilled a well of a different um, to a different depth. So here we've got a comparison of a well that's been drilled down to just 5,000 meters as opposed to our 6,000 meter well. Um, and so, so that's essentially using that same temperature profile that we had before, but I've just cut the, the one of the wells off at 5,000 meters instead of going down to the six. So the 5,000 meter curve is the orange curve and the 6,000 meter well is the blue curve. And somewhat surprisingly, we seem to get better output from the shallower well. Um, the reason for this, and, and the second plot, we're looking at the pressures here. And so the reason for this is that um, for the deeper well, we're encountering slightly, um, we're encountering higher pressures at, in the reservoir of 366 bar, but also higher temperatures. And, the, and it's those higher temperatures that are then giving us a, a lower density fluid. At the, um, for the shallower well, we have a slightly higher density fluid, so 200 kilograms per cubic meter. So what we've got here is we've got a little bit of a trade-off. So we've got the pressure differential between the reservoir and the well that gives rise to the same wellhead pressure. So, so I've, I've, I've run this, sorry, I should say that what I've done here is that I've taken a, a wellhead pressure at 50, um, 50 bar here, and then I've plotted the two profiles that are, correspond to those two correspond to that wellhead pressure. So the flow rates for these two profiles are different. So we're looking at pressure here now um, down the well for the two profiles. But the reason that we're getting different flow rates is because we've got this higher density. So we've got the slight trade off between the pressure differential between the, the bottom of the well and the reservoir. But then that's counted by the fact that we have a slightly higher density fluid because the temperature is slightly lower. So these systems are complex and the um, really what you're getting out of it is something that is not necessarily intuitive and you need to run through some sort of quantitative assessment of what you're going to get out of it. So just very briefly in summary, um, wellbore modeling can be useful for predicting output from these deep wells that encounter supercritical conditions. However, the conditions that are important for using in these simulations are going to have a high level of uncertainty to them. So those productivity indices and the pressures and temperatures. Um, larger bores provide minim a minor benefit to output from the well. And then lastly, deeper and hotter is not always better. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> thank you, John. Excellent. We've got time for some questions. Uh, uh, there's one or two in the in the chat there. Uh, thanks. For being, uh, these was considered vertical only. Is that correct? Yeah. So for this, it was just a purely vertical well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I had I had a quick question of, about the uh, the simulator and the wellbore sim simulator. If you put in say three feeds, one supercritical at the bottom, say one liquid further at shallower level, and then maybe even a steam zone feed. Would you result in, would that result in some instabilities in flow? In other words, uh, some uh, cycling, possibly? Uh, for potentially. Um, it, unfortunately, the, the types of simulator that we're using for this aren't able to assess that because they are, they are steady flow. So they assume that you've got a flow regime um, that's developed within the well, and then you're just modeling that flow. Um, and so they're not able to um, check, they're not able to reproduce transient type of behavior. Possibly the work that Benoit was talking about before, you might be able to start looking at something like that. There are a few people, there's a group at Auckland um, 
there's a chap at Auckland doing a PhD who's also looking at a transient well bore simulator. So, and I think there's a, a group in Japan who are doing it too. So, so it's something that's starting to become of interest, um, and we can start to answer these questions. But just at this stage, I'm not sure. But I, you know, I, I think, I think the um, having having though that very hot. Um, fluid in that bottom section of the well, I think is going to perhaps change some of our intuitive thinking because the densities are a little bit different from how we think about it. And um, I think we're going to see some. Um, yeah, so I, th I think that's just going to turn around a little bit of the intuition that we have on how these wells behave. OK, thanks. Um, don't know if I've, have I got time for one more question. It's about uh, an interesting paper at the New Zealand Geothermal Workshop about magma flow in a, a well bore. David Dempsey's paper. I don't know if you saw it, but I wondered whether um, whether a similar approach might you might be able to look at uh, other fluids other than uh, other than what what's included, you know, magma itself in in this approach. Yeah, I mean, it, these are highly simplified equations that assume that you have nice fluids that. Um, and uh, I mean, a, a magma is likely to be a, a non-Newtonian fluid of some sort that uh, I'd, I'd be hesitant to try to do it. I, I mean, theoretically you could. It's, it, it, it's a relatively straightforward set of equations and, and you could you could apply some of these equations that relate to these more exotic fluids to it. Um, OK, thanks. <laughs> but, it, but it wouldn't be straightforward and I couldn't just change a couple of numbers here and there and get it to work. So. All right. Well, thanks, John.